I'm actually going to talk about MQTT for industry, past, present, and future. Let's talk about past. So if you guys have been following our content um, for any amount of time, um, listen to me. You guys have heard the, the term unified namespace a million times. Okay. Um, and the abbreviation of that is UNS. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about why I'm so big on MQTT. Um, when was I introduced to MQTT? How do we use MQTT? And where do I think that the MQTT specification needs to go in order to help advance digital transformation in industry even further? But in order to do that, I want to talk about the little where unified namespace came from. So the very first unified namespace that I designed and built was in 2005, from 2003 and 2005, in a salt mine in upstate New York. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give the layout of what this mine looked like and what the problem was that I was trying to solve. So um, this is going to be uh, the bottom of the mine. Uh, so this is the... Um, number three shaft. This was a half, and a, mile, half a mile underground, okay? And now what I'm going to do is do isometric overhead from here. So this is surface over here. And then you also had the number one shaft. This is where we brought the salt up uh, to the uh, number one hoist. And then uh, from the number one hoist, it went out to pads, okay, on conveyor, conveyor systems. The number three hoist, this is surface here. The number three hoist brought the people down. Okay, uh, and so you had a big, big hoist here that dropped a big cage into the shaft that we all uh, worked on. Uh, we, went, we went down on it every single shift. Underground, um, now we're looking overhead. Basically, uh, it was seven miles from, from here to the very end of the mine was seven miles. And I think we had something like 30 miles of conveyors or even longer, 30 miles of conveyor systems underground. The big operation that we had underground was our screen plant. So you had a screen plant, which was all state of the art process control uh, on six level. So we had six level and we had four level and then you had surface. So the screen plant would have to send up a big conveyor to the four level, which was the old part of the mine. This is a four level seam. There was a seam at like 1,800 feet, and then there was a seam at 2,500 feet where we worked. The old seam was, was used around the turn of the century in the, 19, uh, in the early 1900s. But the screen plant would take all the salt that we would mine on six level and it would process that big bulk salt and then we would send it up in a, as a finished product to four level and then it would be brought up in a skip, I think uh, five tons at a time uh, every 60 seconds. And then that raw salt would be taken out to pads, okay? On six level where we worked, um, you basically had a big long roadway. You had a, a really, really long roadway that went out and you had a shop here, which is where we worked on all of the equipment. And then going out, way out into the mine, you had, you basically would mine to the surf, to the, to the shore. And these were called panels, okay? And then you would mine to the shore, and then you would mine to the shore, okay? And you would do the, the same thing here, mine to the shore, Mine to the shore, mine to the shore. All right, these, where we, we were mining here, this was all temporary. So temporary conveyor systems would go in to bring the salt in this direction before it went on the main conveyor system that went to the screen plant, okay? So the main conveyor system that went to the screen plant and uh, it would jump over here and jump over here and jump over here. But you would have a temporary conveyor system and then you would have the main conveyor system that went to the screen plant. And then from the screen plant, 
that main conveyor system would go to four level, you'd have a whole host of processes here, and then it would go up to surface. All right, the challenge that we faced at the time, and these belt lines, these, belt, the, these lines were actually broken into uh, segments. So the belts were never any longer than, uh, any one conveyor system was never longer than uh, 300 feet. I'm pretty sure it was 300 feet, three or 400 feet because, uh, because of the weight of the salt. So they would do transfers. So you'd go, you know, 300 feet and then you would transfer. Basically, you'd come up a chute, drop down, and then you'd start it on a new conveyor and you'd transfer and you'd transfer and you'd transfer. And you'd have all sorts of maintenance problems where like dust would accrue here, dust would accrue here, accrue here, accrue here. You'd have a motor, okay? You'd have a motor at the head of each of these conveyors. Okay, you'd have motors here, okay. Um, you had one mechanic and one electrician who was responsible for the entire mine. So one electrician and one mechanic who was responsible for everything, okay. The speed limit underground was 15 miles an hour. We drove pickup trucks. It was it, basically everything that we did was reacting to crisis. And so where the first unified namespace namespace came from was I wanted to create a single source of truth, a single source of truth for all data and information um, and current state. I wanted to monitor current state of the entire mine, all underground and on surface. And at the time in 2002, 2003, that was actually really, really hard to do. TCP IP had just won the protocol wars. All of our communications underground were serial communications. So what I did was I looked at what we had, which was primarily data highway plus drops. Everything was Rockwell automation. We had data highway, drop, data highway plus drops that came all the way back to our shop. And in fact, we, we had DH plus connections all the way to the surface. So what we did was we put in, well, what I did was we put in a control logics gateway with RS links so that we could communicate with all of the smart things in the mine in 2003. And then what we did was I used Microsoft Excel and uh, Dynamic Data Exchange, DDE, which is a topic um, mechanism in Microsoft Excel, to create this. Um, and I, I actually have to look back at the old namespace. I have a screenshot of the original namespace. So the namespace looked something like this. Uh, it was the company, it was Cargill, and then the Lansing Mine, and then it was surface and underground and then you had uh, this was 40B and this was 40A the panels um, so you had 40A you had 40B and then you had all the belts so you had A belt B belt C belt A belt B belt, C belt, and the way that we, I, I could publish this into a, a my, these were cells inside of Microsoft Excel. I could publish this using the dynamic data exchange, which basically said the value of A is going to equal uh, RS links. This is the reference, uh, and then topic. You could do the same thing in Wonderware, and then the tag name. And that was going to be the tag name in RS Links. And by creating these references with RS Links using Dynamic Data Exchange, I was able to create a single spreadsheet that I could share. As long as you were on the intranet, I could share that spreadsheet, one worksheet, with anyone. And as long as they were on the intranet, they could see current state of the production operations of the entire mine. And that was in 2005. It was one single source of truth that came through these Data Highway Plus drops 
here to this control logics. We had data highway Rio cards, and then we used RS links to then map all those values here. A couple of years later, literally from 2005, I I'd used Excel. Then from 2006 through um, 2008, I used Wonderware InTouch. You could do the same thing with InTouch. Um, and then I got introduced to Ignition in 2008. And from that point, from 2008 through 2012, which is the project that kind of made my career, um, I used Ignition with OPC, DA, and UA initially. That's when I learned that OPC didn't scale at the enterprise level. And you'll notice everything that we did here, this is one site and it is all process related. So there was, this is all up to L3. There was no, no data and information that we would, that we put into the unified namespace that was business related. So that is total tons sold. We didn't put anything like that in there. Uh, what was the, you know, this contract that goes to this municipality, what they're paying per ton, none of that stuff was in the UNS. So when we were producing salt, we could not come, we couldn't do an analysis of production that was being produced here with the customer it was actually going through up there. It was just way too early in the, in the design of the unified namespace architecture. After I did this first unified namespace in 2005 using dynamic data exchange, I was always on a search for a better protocol because one of the big issues here with Data Highway Plus is that it's obviously serial and it's poll response. Um, it was, it, you know, and basically you had poll response here at this level and poll response at this level and poll response here. This is all server client architecture. From 2008 through 2012, I was doing the same thing, but I was doing it in Ignition, and I was using OPC, DA, and UA, and that, and we were actually doing um, integrations through the L4 layer. All right, so with that, that is the, what did we used to do? Where did the unified namespace come from? What we're gonna do is I'm gonna cut over, we're gonna, I'm gonna move over to my desk, and I'm gonna take you through, um, current state. I'm going, to I'm going to talk a little bit about my first introduction to MQTT. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the big project I did in 2012 that really defined my career and made people start listening to me. Um, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about from 2012, how were we building unified namespaces between 2012 and 2016 when I got introduced to MQTT for industry for the very first time.